Welcome to the Work Positive Podcast with your host, executive coach and culture architect, Dr. Joey Fawcett. Discover strategies and tactics that work positive as Dr. Joey talks with industry leaders who create a positive work culture that attracts top talent and reduces team turnover. Discover how you can create a work positive culture that increases productivity and profits. Here's your host, Dr. Joey. Hey, Work Positive Nation, you know that you need a diversity of people as top talent on your team, right? I mean, you know that. Okay, knowing that and knowing how to do that are two different things because most of us are so myopic. We want to attract people like us, like attracts like, right? And yet for your company to innovate, for it to create, which is necessary to stay in business today, right? For your company to still be here in 18 months, you absolutely positively have to figure out how to get a diverse group of people on board and attracting top talent in that way. So how do you do that? Well, of course, you look at the skill sets. We know we have to have a diversity of skill sets. But what about their stories and diversity of stories, their life experiences, where they come from? You know, I'm a Southerner, so I want to know who's your mama, who's your daddy, right? Those those kinds of things. I want to know all about your background. But some people are like, nope, not going to tell my story. So how do you, in attracting top talent and keeping them on your team, put together that diversity of points of view, perspective, life experiences, so that your company can innovate and create. What we need, Work Positive Nation, is a way of demystifying diversity. Well, then, if that's what we need, this podcast is for you. This will be your favorite episode because we have the expert in demystifying diversity on the podcast today. She is in the house. She stepped outside of her own house for just a moment because demystifying diversity is her podcast. So be sure after this episode to go check it out on your favorite uh, provider, demystifying diversity. Also, if you're a reader and we know that leaders are readers, right? You go over to Amazon, being in wherever you find books are sold and you find your copy of Demystifying Diversity, you can go to DarylleeSlyons.com right now as you listen to this podcast and you can meet my special guest today. Work Positive Nation, help me welcome Darylise Lyons to the podcast. Darylise, what a great day for me. Oh my gosh, Dr. Joey, what a phenomenal introduction. It's so great to be here with you and with your listeners and thanks so much for having me. Oh, what a pleasure. What a pleasure. Mm -mm -mm. So you and I, right, we understand that demystifying diversity is the great need. You've written a book about it. You've got a podcast about it with all these amazing guests that help us do that. What are you learning that Work Positive Nation can apply to attracting top talent? Yeah, I think one of the things that is really important is you started off, Dr. Joey, talking about the, what I think for granted, you take for granted, but this importance, right, of having diversity of identities, of experiences, of stories, of mm. perspectives. And I think one fundamental things that I try to do when I go into an organization is to just make sure that from a paradigm level, they have that premise. They're operating from that premise of the importance of diversity. And I can talk a little bit more about some of why diversity is important, but I think that people are innovative uh, inherently. And yes. so before before really making recommendations, I go into organizations and I just say, let's, let, let's look at why diversity matters. And we talk mm -hmm. about why diversity matters. And once people know that it matters and become really um, invested in bringing in diversity of people, then they can create strategies around that. So I'd be happy to talk about more about strategies, but I think it's less about checking boxes and logistics and more about having this paradigm of diversity mm -hmm. is super important and then let the paradigm drive the logistics because then if any particular technique isn't effective or doesn't have the desired outcome, people then will choose a different technique as opposed to just giving up on the project altogether. Oh yeah. I love that, that metaphor. We want to shift away from checking boxes because it's, it's just so easy, right? Let's just check that box. We got the DEI box check. Let's move forward. Okay. How do we get to that paradigm level? Yeah. So one thing that I really, there's a expert that I interviewed for my podcast who said at one point, it was really kind of awesome, but she said, you know, have you ever seen a homogenous group of people make a decision? And I was like, 
yeah. And she goes, well, they make very bad decisions very quickly. And I thought about that. And I think the first thing that I talk about with people is like, okay, so if you are limited, right, to your own stories, your own perspectives, your own experiences, your own perspective, your own point of view. So if you're surrounded by people who are also limited by the same stories, experiences, perspectives, and point of view, then you're not going to see what you can't see. And so I give some examples of, you know, there was a group, a, a marketing research company that was branding and website development for an organization. And it was a a bunch of like really sports centric men in a room making decisions and which is like (laughs) fine, you know, but then they invited someone to look at the graphics that they'd come up with the website design that they come up with. And she was like, okay, none of this appeals to about 50% of the population. Like, have you thought about the fact that your branding is very, very, you know, male oriented. And this was not an organization that was targeting a specifically, you know, a specifically male audience. And so Uh I think it's, I give examples like that or examples of things like, you know, curb cuts and sidewalks, right? I'm sure we all know the the curb cut effect, which I'll just explain it a little bit. But um, in the sidewalks, there's like those little slopes at the end of sidewalks that are, were originally designed for wheelchairs to go on. And now, you know, like delivery people and uh, people pushing strollers and, you know, anyone perhaps with any sort of physical mobility issue, like really relies on those. They're so helpful. I use yeah. them, you know, keeps me from tripping. Um, and uh, and those were created for a specific subset of the disability community, right? And there's so many innovations that we can look at in this world that are like, oh, this was a solution that was brought about because a particular person of a particular identity was able to see a need that mm. someone who doesn't hold that identity would not be able to see. And so once we re- I really start talking about that and talking about, you know, all the research shows that companies that are more diverse are uh, significantly more profitable, um, mm. encourage employee retention, create greater psychological safety, um, make people feel like they can belong, make people feel like if they go through life changes while at an organization, that is sustainable for them and they can you know, uh, pivot with the organization and the organization will rise to, to meet them where they are. So yeah, I mean, I think there's, I could talk probably for three hours on just some of the benefits of diversity and how to go in and really get people to think about how to shift their own mindset. And then the other thing is, is most of us have someone in our lives who is near and dear to us Mm. who holds an underrepresented identity, like perhaps a child with autism or, you know, someone's married to a person of a particular ethnic or religious minority or something, you know, and Mm -hmm. so most people can really see how the lack of diversity readiness and the lack of receptivity has been impactful to someone in their life. And then they don't Mm -hmm. want to be that way. Or if someone is themselves a minority, like often tend to come to situations with more of a understanding of why it's so important to be diversity ready and diversity sort of agile. However, Mm -hmm. I think even within that, like just acknowledging that no identity is inherently bad or wrong or even problematic. Um, and everybody has something beautiful to bring to the table. But I think we've been mm. overemphasizing certain voices. And so it's really about like, how do we create equity of opportunity? Mm. Mm. I love that. Yeah, we, we have been hearing one voice yeah. for a very long time, haven't we? And, and yet the richness, the harmonies that come from so many different voices. I mean, Diana Ross was good. Don't get me wrong, but Diana Ross and the Supremes now. <laughs> that was great. So that's kind of the picture I carry in my head uh, is that the uh, harmony sounds so much better than, than a solo. And yet we have for so long, Darylise, been stuck in what I call the ego economy. And so whoever's sitting in the big chair, it's all about, it's been him, right? And uh, it's been guys who looked a lot like me, right? <laughs> and, and they've sat in that big chair for so long and they've been the dominant voice. And so how do we transition from that? I mean, it seems to be a huge challenge for me. How can somebody, let's say they're, they're new to Work Positive Nation and they're, they're looking to take some baby steps away from the monotone voice, that one voice that's been speaking in an echo chamber often, right? How do they begin to take those steps away to implement that paradigm shift that you're talking about? 
Yeah. Well, that's such a broad question. And I love it so much. One thing that I'll say is just that even within the assumption of homogeneity, even within the assumption that everyone of a certain identity, like, you know, is that same voice. I just want to point out that there is such a diversity even within like the, you know, the white man experience, right? Like there's, um, I mean, Dr. Joey, we were talking a little bit before we got on this podcast and you come from the South and like someone else who comes from the North might be a totally Mm -hmm. different experience of privilege and opportunity. And there's a lot of research showing that most CEOs are over six feet tall, like, which is incredible because the vast population of people is not um, over six feet tall. And so I I think there's this assumption that like every person of a certain identity holds a certain level of privilege. And so first I would Mm. just want to dismantle that and say that, that, yeah, like there, there is diversity even within these identity groups, diversity of sexual orientation and yep. gender expression and right. and physical abilities and all of that. So I kind of would start from that premise. Like what is the existing diversity here in this place, mm. even a place that doesn't maybe seem visibly diverse. And we would delve into that. Um, and then we would start off thinking about like, well, okay, so who isn't represented here and who, mm. who could be a real asset to your team? Because that's another thing. I think, you know, when, when diversity is a check the box exercise, people think about it as something they're doing for other people mm. rather than something that they're personally invested in. Yes. And so, you know, sitting in a room with different corporate executives and being like, okay, so you want to appeal to a younger demographic, but like, is anyone on your team younger? You know, is yeah. any one on your team. Yeah. Like going to be <laughs> thinking in the way that, that people might be thinking who have certain, who are at a certain stage of their life. Right. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, you want to appeal to an older demographic and like, so why are you rushing people out once they hit quote unquote retirement age? Mm-hmm. Right. Or, you know, have you noticed that actually like you have a lot of um, turnover among a certain demographic or you know, like, so it really starts off by looking at what is here, what is missing? How mm. could we best serve the organization? How can we serve the client base? How can we expand the client mm. base? Mm-hmm. And recognizing that that actually can't, that a lot of that work can't be done without embracing diversity. Because if someone says, okay, we want to appeal to a certain demographic of people, but there's no one of that demographic on on the team that's making mm-hmm. decisions. Like it, it doesn't really take rocket science to point out that you're you're probably <laughs> not going to be able to know <laughs> what you don't know. And yeah. so, uh, so th- there needs to be an invitation to bring people on who do know a little something about it. Mm, absolutely. So we move from the ego economy to what I refer to as the we economy. Then the question becomes, who's we? Yes. And who else needs to be at the table to help this company innovate and create? Daryl Lee Lyons is my guest on this episode of the Work Positive Podcast. Uh, while you're listening to us, go over to DarylLeeSlyons.com or you can go to BNN, Amazon, wherever you want to go, pick up a copy of her book, Demystifying Diversity. And that's exactly what we're doing today. So I attract top talent. I become aware that we needs to be broader than what it has been, right? I've, I've made this shift. And so now I'm diversifying my we, I'm broadening my we, I'm beginning to see some profitability. These teams though, need some help staying together. Because as you mentioned earlier, what if I've got a lot of turnover in one particular age group? Sometimes my back door becomes like 10 times the size of my front door. (laughs) How do I close the back door or at least make it smaller with these teams knowing that the friction that occurs sometimes in the midst of diverse teams can yield either light or heat. And I'd like to bring some light. How do I do that? What are some of the things I pay attention to, Darylise? Yeah. So um, I think that's such an important question. And really, I want to say that um, there's individual change and there's systemic change and individual change sort of operates from the perspective of like, okay, I'm going to work with each individual person Mm -hmm. and systemic change is more about let's change the structure of the systems to support certain behaviors and encourage certain behaviors. And what I want to say is that my approach would be slightly different if an organization is a lot smaller than if an organization is a lot larger. I think with larger organizations, you have to take a more systemic approach um, Mm -hmm. just because of 
for pragmatic reasons, it's sure. not always possible right. to touch each and every person in the way that that their hearts might need to be shifted in order to to create those greater openings. Although, you know, some larger organizations do a really good job of that. So in huge organizations, they tend to have something called employee resource groups or affinity groups or something where people do come together around a specific element of identity and discuss mm. their needs, their challenges, et cetera. And then usually someone within that group is empowered to go back to the HR department or the people's department and sort of say like, okay, these are the things that need to happen. But I think at smaller organizations, it really is about the chain of reporting and like, and who feels safe talking to whom. Mm -hmm. And I think that if people feel, or at least my observation has been that if people feel like they're in an environment where they're encouraged to be honest, where they can bring their concerns forward, where they can talk about what is bothering them, when it is kind of like a slight wound or a slight ouch, I mm. think those are the organizations that retain people much better than mm. the organizations where there's a culture or an environment that discourages real interpersonal discourse and discourse with people who are empowered to make changes. So for example, like there's, you know, there's a certain benefit that I can get from saying something to my coworker who will then commiserate with me, but that doesn't necessarily mean that anything's going to change. So if I, mm. if I'm working in an environment where I can go to a manager, or go to a leader and say like, Hey, I'm noticing this and I'm not comfortable with this, or I feel really stressed out with the way that meetings are happening or, you know, or I'm bumping heads with this particular person on my team. And that manager is like, okay, well, let's work together to devise a strategy or a solution, or here are some options. I think those are environments that really tend to retain talent mm. and organizations where, leadership does take a more service oriented approach and feels like, okay, I'm here. My people are incredibly talented and they, they are, they're going to do incredible and innovative things. And all I need to do is support them in being able to do that. I think those leaders tend to get the most out of their employees from a diversity perspective, but also just from a, from every perspective. Thank you. Yeah. From uh, a human being perspective, yes, yes. <laughs> as opposed to a human doing, because as you're talking about this service orientation, it seems to me it's just been a generation or two ago that we were human doings and, and these kinds of service orientation towards your team members, that was non-existent. You put yeah. your head down, you shut up, you come to work and all of a sudden, the lid's blown off of all of that. And so now we see, again, the great redefinition of work. We're seeing people for who they are as human beings as opposed to human doings. So I love that phrase you just used, the service orientation. Typically that's reserved for clients and customers, right? But the internal service orientation and the opportunity to have an environment where you can explore, right? Yeah leads to that innovation and creativity and trust is the currency of change, right? So Yeah, well, and to your point, Dr. Joey, I think people, it's sort of a double bind because yes, on the one hand, workers are looking for more out of their employment and out of their employers and out of their workplace environment. And on the other hand, people are working harder than ever in a lot yes. of ways, right? I mean, there's, I, you know, it, like it's not unheard of to get an email at 2 a.m. from about a work related issue or it to won't get, be from me. Let me yeah, just right? yeah, it won't be from me. But it, you know, or to get text messages on the weekend about something or to have you know, especially now with the blurring of boundaries between work and, and home and mm. people working from home, which is beautiful and flexible and, and dynamic, but a lot of people but. struggle to have those strong boundaries and a lot of employers struggle to have those strong boundaries. And so I think because we are more accessible than ever, I think workplaces have to be more sensitive than ever to the wholeness of a human being. And we're not as compartmentalized. So I think it is a really wonderful forward movement that's happening in some ways, but there is the downside of it, which is that because workplaces are more expansive and broad, I think it is less and less tenable to show up inauthentically mm. in those mm. spaces. And so we have to be creating spaces where people can bring however much of themselves they choose to work because they're expected to be more work oriented. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not just eight to five or 
seven to four anymore, right? Right. Uh, now we're so technologically accessible. And I'm so glad you brought that up because that seems to me to be one of the great challenges in creating a positive work culture now is looking not only at the diversity among the people on our teams, but looking at the diverse needs of people within their own lives. Yes, yes they want to contribute to the company's growth, right? And that's where the jazz happens is when my personal mission and the company mission align. And so I'm taking actions and it's so fulfilling and what have you. However, all play, all work and no play makes Joey burn out, right? Yes. I mean, I, I'm, I'm drooling on myself over in the corner pretty quickly. If I don't get some time with our two and a half year old granddaughter or something like that, you know, or, or go ride a tractor or get on a horse or something, those are the things that feed me outside of work, which again, bring the openness of, of mind space where I can be innovative and, and creative and those kinds of things. So by the way, Outlook has a feature that will allow you to automatically schedule emails so they don't show up at 2 a.m. Yeah. If you wonder where that is, call me. I'll be glad to show you <laughs> what that function is. Because I, I consider that highly intrusive um, mm -hmm. just as much as I would a, a text coming on the weekend unless the house is on fire, right? Then, then you can expect a text from me. That challenge seems to me to be an opportunity for companies who besides just checking boxes, look at the joy de vivre of the human spirit and begin to develop their team members. How can we address that challenge as a company and, and really green each other with hope and the kinds of things that restore the human spirit? Mm, yeah. I mean, so many, there's so many beautiful and innovative approaches to this. And I want people to think creatively and expansively. I can give Absolutely. some examples, but I think to your point about people having different needs and different things outside of work and a need for space outside of work, I think many employers that are doing this successfully honor that and also bring that same acknowledgement into the workplace. And so what I mean by that is mm. um, there's a lot of companies that schedule like 50 minute meetings rather than hour long meetings so that they build in a 10 minute buffer for employees. Um, mm. There's a lot of employers that will give, you know, company wide days off, or even if that's not tenable to give a company wide day off, they might say like, okay, these members of this team, are off on Monday and then these other members of the same team can have Tuesday off or whatnot, but really kind of building space into the schedule, having things like, I mean, I think this was when people were working more in person, I, we had the opportunity to have like small talk, which often seems like a waste of time, but it's hugely beneficial to, give, to giving the brain a break. Yep. Um, I think also honoring that people are different. There are introverted people, there are extroverted people. And so giving people <laughs> the space to say like, okay, maybe we can brainstorm within the context of a meeting, but, and then also like everyone take some time, think about things. You can approach me in any way. You can send an email, you can, we can have a one-on-one, -on -one, et cetera. So I think really knowing that people think differently and people's brains need different levels of stimulation and different yeah. orientations is super important. Yeah. And then also respecting people's time and space. So maybe yeah. not sending that email at 2 a.m. Um, and and waiting and holding off or, or possibly even um, just having some sort of flexible work schedule, which so many more organizations are, mm -hmm. are doing that and allowing people to be empowered to manage their own either work hours or work, you know, or where they're working. Certainly the attitude that people take towards things when someone has a medical appointment and has to, you know, take a little bit of time off or... I don't know, you know, has to leave to pick their kids up from mm -hmm. from school or what have you, but just like really kind of making space for people to have space in their lives and also not making space differently for people who hold different identities. So or different or in different stages of life. So I just gave the yeah. example of the person who needs to leave early to go pick their kids up from school. There can be a lot of hostility that happens within teams. If one person who is, let's say, a parent or a caregiver is leaving early, the person who's not might feel like, well, how come they get to leave early? How come I don't? And so <laughs> if you're a manager, just really making sure that you honor that all of your teammates are treated in an equitable way. And right. so really being above board with that, like, okay, yeah, so-and-so is leaving early and also they're going to 
make up those hours, their own time at home later, or saying to the employee who might not be required to be somewhere else, like, hey, you've been putting in a lot of hours, like, why don't you just take a half day tomorrow or something like that? So like, really just looking at, are people being treated fairly? Do people feel like, you know, any one identity is being privileged over another? Um, Mm -hmm. Because all of that stuff can create a lot of contention and a lack of cohesion. Um, And so I do think as managers, as leaders, we need to be responsive to the needs that people bring to us. But I think the really great leaders anticipate needs in advance and even see things that aren't going to be brought to them because that's how someone, I I think that's where people really become very loyal to an organization and very Mm -hmm. loyal to their team is when they feel like, wow, this person is looking out for me, even when I'm not looking out for myself, like they care Mm -hmm. so much about my mental health and about my wellness and about me as a whole person that I just want to give all the best of me to this organization. Absolutely. Well, that goes back to what we were talking about earlier, and that is the creation of trusting relationships, which Mm -hmm. come from listening to each other's story and an appreciation of that, building that psychological safety into the team, right? To where I feel like I can step up and, okay, I may not have to go pick my kid up, but I may be having a, I call them less than days and greater than days. That's one thing I remember from math class back in high school, but, you know, maybe it's a less than day for me, right? And so uh, being able to step up and just declare to my leader, Hey, man, I'm having a less than day. Uh, I'm, I'm going to take off after lunch and go do something to restore me. And I'll make it back later, just like the person did who had to go pick up their kid from the child care center. Right. So I that love that. I think safety. leaders can model. Oh, I'm sorry. I just I think leaders can model that, too, though. I I, I, I think. Yeah. And I just realized I gave the impression that like people should always be able to approach no, their, no, no, their no. leaders. It's that modeling aspect, yeah. right? Because mm-hmm. the leader just says, hey, guys, I need to step away this afternoon. But we're recording this on Labor Day weekend, right? I need to step away Friday afternoon to to because uh, my wife and I are celebrating our anniversary this weekend. You know, I need to step yeah. away and do something fun. But that modeling, man, that just and trusting your people. Yes. Right to do the work that the work's going to continue on. So yeah, yeah. that's an amazing thing. Darylise Lyons is my guest on this episode of Work Positive Podcast. Go to darylieslyons.com if you're walking the dog or on the Peloton or something. But don't worry, it's in the show notes. You can find it there. Her book is Demystifying Diversity. It's available wherever fine books are sold. And if you're looking for a podcast to add to the Work Positive Podcast, be sure to go pick up Demystifying Diversity Podcast, and you get to listen to the incredible Dare Lease Lines all the time, every podcast. <laughs> Wouldn't that be cool? I mean, that would be like green pastures for everybody, right? Just to enjoy that time <laughs> together. Dare Lease Work Positive Nation always wants to know one thing from my guest, and that one thing is, what is the one thing that we can start doing today to demystify diversity? Sure. I believe that leading with listening is probably the most important thing that people can do. It builds empathy muscles. Most people, myself included, who are, you know, yeah, most people tend to lead with talking right, and like wanting to make our own needs heard. Uh, And so I think just like really practicing attentive listening to people and noticing what space that that creates both in your work life and in your personal life um, is huge. So I would encourage people to um, ask someone that possibly in your life, you notice like you take up more space than they do in the relationship. Just ask them something about themselves and then sit and listen and be curious and continue to ask them about themselves. And then, you know, a couple of days later, do the same thing and the same thing and notice how that relationship shifts. And I think those skills of, of listening and receptivity can be transferred into every area of our lives and are certainly necessary if we're wanting people with underrepresented voices to share with us. Mm, yeah. Uh, warmly feathering the nest yes. so that they can step up into that space that you just created uh, of conversational generosity, right? Mm-hmm. To where you welcome their stories and hear from them. That's a beautiful one thing. DarylEastLions.com's website you want to go to right now, Demystifying Diversity. That's the next book you want to put in your Kindle. And uh, be sure to check out whatever podcast player you use. 
go add Demystifying Diversity podcast to yours. Dear Lisa, I've learned so much today, so much wisdom. I am so grateful for the time that you've given us, for the wisdom that you shared with Work Positive Nation today. And uh, thank you so much for your time and wisdom. Oh, thank you so much for having me. And if any of your guests have any questions or want to follow up, please um, go to DaraLeeSlyons.com. You can send me an email or whatnot, because I, I feel like we only scratched the surface and we could have gone so much deeper. And this was such a beautiful experience. I learned so much um, from our interaction. So thank you. Thank you for having me. The pleasure is mine. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Work Positive Podcast. Please share this podcast with your friends who are HR and small business leaders so they can do one thing today to create a positive work culture that increases productivity and profits. I'd like to give you a free Work Positive course just for listening. It's called Something to Talk About, and it's transformed the work conversations of so many people all over the world. Get your free copy when you go to workpositive.today slash something to talk about and you can start transforming your conversations today. Remember, it pays to work positive.